Yeah. We do. We do. If I could grab everybody's attention, I think we'll go ahead and get started. First of all, what a fabulous problem to have, right? <laughs> We're so excited and eager to have our speaker today, and you can tell because of how, how full the room is. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for joining us today at the Rice County Historical Society. For those of you who don't know, my name is Sue Garwood, and I'm the Executive Director. Before we get started, I've got to do a little housekeeping. My board asks me to do this every time, so I do. Um, first of all, thank you to those who are members. Your membership is actually helping to pay for this program. Your membership uh, paid for the staff, and we were able to write a grant to the Minnesota Humanities Center that allowed us to fund this program and make it available to you at no cost. So thank you for that. Those of you who aren't members, we invite you to consider joining. Um, with your membership, you get our newsletter that announces programs like this, as well as other historical artifacts or uh, articles. Um, there's also, uh, you get reduced rates for programs and events. Example is one coming up in, uh, on October 27th is our annual meeting, and there's a $5 savings if you're, uh, if you're a member. And that's per ticket, so if there's a couple, that's $10 right there of your membership. Um, and that's, of course, uh, from a year from when you join. So it doesn't matter when you join. It's just 12 months from that time. And then again, you help uh, preserve history by helping us do what we do. And now, let's turn to why we are here. <laughs> it is my profound honor to introduce Todd. Todd stumbled into our museum about a year ago <laughs> and since then has graced us with information and kindness and generosity. So with that in mind, if you'll please all welcome me in, or welcome Todd, <laughs> join me, there it is, join me in welcoming Todd. It's been a long day. Oh, how much are you pay? To chante, wash the you how money, damakota yakupe. Hello, my relatives. Uh, my name is He Who Walks With His Good Heart. Uh, most, my American name is Todd Finney. Uh, most folks just call me Papa Bear. Um, so, yeah, this was just kind of one of those things where I'm not used to doing this. Usually my cousin, uh, Frankie Jackson, uh, he's a tribal uh, THPO, Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, or my cousin John Eagle, who is also a THPO, which is Tribal Historical Preservation Officer, um, do talks like this, but I am also what's called an Iyapaha, which means a voice uh, for a ride called the Dakota 38 ride. And it's also known as the Dakota 38 plus two Wokiksuye. Uh, so every December 10th, uh, we leave Lower Brule, South Dakota on horseback, some of us in trucks, some of us on horseback, and we do a, a Wokiksuye, a ride, a prayer ride. And the prayer ride is to forgive everyone everything. Uh, it was started by my uncle Jim Miller, um, who had a dream and a vision that to try and help make things right, we should ride back to a site that had a lot of memories. Uh, this, most of my family recognizes as Nishota Makoche. Uh, the land where the water reflects heaven uh, is actually what my grandma says. Uh, if you hear ask a ham's beer, it's the land of the sky blue waters. <laughs> <laughs> um, and honestly, uh, I'm originally from South Minneapolis. Uh, None of this was really on my radar until 2012 when I was woken up out of a dream and I felt like I had to go to Mankato. It was December 26th. I had no idea why. Actually, the only thing I knew is we stayed away from Mankato. And I basically negotiated with God and I said, here's the deal. I got a 12-year-old sleeping in the other room. It's the day after Christmas. His toys are everywhere. So if you get him and get him to agree, I'll go. Well, my son Andre, who we just all call Bubs, hopped out of bed and said, okay, Dad, let's go. And so 
this, the, the journey there is a whole other story I'll share another time, but we made it to Mankato. And all of a sudden, we heard this noise. Somebody yelled, the riders are coming. And here, and here come these people in bonnets and regalia and all of these things. And I didn't even know how to deal with it. And my son started crying and I started crying and it was weird because we're city Indians. I grew up in South Minneapolis. You know, I, I knew that uh, my family had legacy on both sides, but I was growing up in Minneapolis in the 80s. There wasn't much to be um, proud to be Indian about at that time. Uh, I ended up by figuring out that my biological family on my mom's side was a large part of the ride. In fact, shortly thereafter, my aunt Alberta, who is Jim's wife, said, hey, you should be a part of this Dakota honoring because you already go to the church in Mankato that's happening at and you are our family. You need to be a part of this. I said, okay, whatever. On the way to the church, and you guys are just going to have to go with me on this because I'm still trying to work all of this out. Um, I was listening to some drum music. I'm driving my Buick LaCrosse, very sacred. And... Uh, <laughs> All of a sudden, I look to my right, and I can see riders in regalia riding alongside of me. And I look down, and I'm sitting on a horse. Shake my head, and everything's back to normal. And I was just like, that was weird. I get to Mankato. I tell my aunt about it. And she goes, where do you live again? I said, well, I live in Medford. She goes, oh, where's that? I said, oh, it's, a, it's just south of Faribault. And she goes, oh, you know that we come from one leg south of Faribault. I said, what do you mean? And she goes, before, before our family got pushed out, we were Wapakute, Dakota. And we came from, we came just south of Faribault. We used to, our family used to trade with Alexander Faribault. I said, that was weird. And she said, you need, you're there for purpose. Because I didn't move down here till seven years ago. When I was living in South Minneapolis, I married a beautiful German woman um, who loves me in spite of myself. And uh, I had an 18-year-old, and she had a 12-year-old, and my 18-year-old was going off to college. And the 12-year-old was going into seventh grade, and I made the decision that was probably not great for a 12-year-old from Medford to be immersed in um, South Minneapolis public schools. And so I made the decision to move south. And it was also the same year of the Dakota Honoring. There's a lot of history here that I've, I've learned about recently. And so it's, Sue has been just so gracious in that because it's always been so strange because so much of our history, we're the only ones who know it. You know, from my, my uh, dad's side of the family, we're Oglala Lakota, uh, part of the wild Oglala. Um, the wild Oglala were known as the men who went up into the hills. And we didn't make treaty. In fact, the cavalry tried to make treaty with us a few times, and we just ended up with more horses. Um, <laughs> The Wapakute side of my family is, is uh, Mapia Maza, which means Iron Cloud. And it was actually large enough so that it is one, every one of our tribes has seven subbands, and one of the subbands is Mapia Maza. Um, and that includes Chief Iron Cloud and uh, pretty much a huge amount of people with, with the last name Iron Cloud. As, we start, as I started uncovering a lot of this, I just started finding history. My son, when he was young, um, in like first or second grade, got this th project that he came home with. Sorry, one of my eyes is watering. Um, the project is where are you from? And I remember him coming home 
And he's like, Dad, we did this really cool project about where we're from. I said, cool. He goes, so Dad, where are we from? <laughs> I said, we're from here. And he goes, no, like Germany or England or Ireland. Like, where did we come from? I said, well, from here. He said, no, 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 Dad. Everybody came from somewhere else. That's what, that's what we were taught. Everybody came from somewhere else. Where did we come from? I said, well, you're going to have to talk to your great-grandmother because she swears that for 48 generations and you're the 48th generation, we've been here. He said, what? He said, our family's from here, Andre. We've, we've been here. We've just been here. And so between that and so many other things, I just started discovering these histories. The hardest part is, is that so many of the stories that I would be taught didn't jive with the history books. Sure. You know, I learned that, our, I learned from my uncle Arvel, uh, his, na his name's Arvel Looking Horse, that we had star charts that we could circumnavigate the globe from and the Spaniards actually used the star charts to get into the, into the actual East Indies and all of that stuff, or West Indies. Um, that we, we had the ability to transfer large materials across great spans of area. Um, and if you have questions about that, you can go to Tel Aviv and you can look at the cornerstones of Solomon's Temple and you'll notice that one of them is this ruddy red rock. And the thing that they're trying to figure out right now is how did Pipestone get into the middle of Israel? And that early, where it's considered one of the cornerstones of King Solomon's temple. We had all of these different things. And I think my older brother said it best. He said it's a lot easier to kill a godless savage than it is to kill a faith-filled family man. My grand, my, my aunt actually tricked me into the Dakota 38 ride because I was a city Indian. I rode horses when I was little to help people out and stuff like that, but I hadn't been on a horse in like 20 plus years. And we're conversational people. We have oral traditions. Um, it's part of what saved the United States in World War II. You had the Navajo code talkers. Mm -hmm. And you had the Dakota, Lakota, Nakota code talkers. Now the thing is, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota are more dialects than anything else. The easiest way to explain it is, is it soda, is it pop, is it cola, or is it Coke? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because if I go to my uncle in the north and I greet him, I say, ho, nekshi, n, n. If I greet one of my uncles here, I say, how dixi, duh. And then if I go to most of my family in the West, I go, how lixi. It was an enunciation. Now, of course, everybody has different slangs, different terms. You pick up things along the way, but the primary, what they call Suan dialect, which I still have issues with, um, it's all primarily the same. We can interact, we can talk. And fortunately, as you'll see, the, um, soon the Smithsonian is actually going to recognize um, our primal land, which goes from Illinois to Wyoming, 200 miles into Canada, and down into Texas. We had a lot of really cool treaties with a lot of really cool people. So if you go into the Southland for like the Oneida, um, the Chikasha, um, Chikasha means actually the guardians of the juniper. Unfortunately, somebody wrote it down and went, Chicksaw. Y'all are the Chicksaw. And we had the Washichita, the guardians of the fatted plain. Wrote it down and somebody went, Wichita. Y'all are Wichita. <laughs> so our language and our, all of our primary people groups you actually see on signs all over the place in the Midwest. You see our words everywhere. But because of its, the time and the elimination, it's been lost. And honestly, for the longest time, I didn't want to have anything to do with it because what does it matter? It 
it does. So I'm standing in, I actually was a part of New Creation World Outreach Church who I love dearly, and they decided to start feeding the ride, and my wife said, well, you should volunteer because your family's coming. I said, sure. And so the first year we served them, and the second year we served them, and my aunt stood next to me in line, and she said, it's good to see everybody, right? Yeah. Good food's really good, right? Yeah. So next year's you here, right? Yeah. Because in our culture, once you've told an elder one way or another, you're just stuck. <laughs> <laughs> and so I started preparing because the next year was the next was the year. One of my sons was already on the ride. Um, and was always like, Dad, you gotta come, you gotta come, you gotta come. And I'm like, oh. negative 30 degrees sitting 10 feet in the air. <laughs> Don't know how I feel about that. Your ancestors did it. <laughs> yeah. And then he said, well, just watch the movie. My Uncle Jim had actually had a documentary made called The Dakota 38. If you want to go to YouTube, you can see it, as, see it anytime you want because the only deal that he made with them is you guys can make the documentary as long as it is always free for anyone to access. What was it? Dakota 38. It's been on PBS a few times. Yep. Yeah, Little Feather Productions. And I started watching the movie. <coughs> and then I saw one of my family, I saw a lot of my family members, but primarily I saw one who I especially loved, and his name was Sidney, Sidney Bird. And he's, he's one of my grandpas. And he started sharing about the movie in Dakota. And he talked about the song. What most people don't know is that the Dakota 38, uh, many of them were spiritual men because they figured out that if they killed the chiefs, we'd just replace them. So they did get some people that they accused of battle. The problem is, is most of those men didn't speak English. Most of their trials took about 10 minutes, and in each one they were all sentenced to death. The thing is, is that the holy men, including one of my great, great, great grandfathers, it didn't matter to them. In fact, there's a story, and you guys can take this wherever you want. These are stories passed down. We have an oral tradition. But one of the stories that I was told was that they were singing and they were praying into the night and all of a sudden the chains fell off their legs and their arms. And the door to the jail opened. And everybody froze and somebody said we should run and my grandfather and a few others, and you'll have to excuse it, we don't recognize distance. So if it's, if it's 10 grandfathers ago or my current living grandfather, it's just grandfather because we're all about Tioshpa or Tiwahe, family. And so no matter how distant or how close, we eliminate that space. In fact, I have one biological son and a whole mess of other kids, but because of our culture, I'm not allowed to differentiate. I'm not allowed to call them steps or adopted or anything like that because it creates a space. And to create that space, you break up the family. They said, we can't go. They have our women, they have our children at Fort Snelling, and if we leave, they'll surely die. And so they put the chains back on and they pulled the door closed and they continued to sing. When the morning came, they actually were praying all the way down to the hanging site. And as they walked up on to the scaffold, they shook the hand of the hangman and forgave him. And then my grandfather stood up and started singing a song. He goes, actually, if you'll excuse me, I'll sing a couple verses of it just to, I, I am not, like I said, this is one of my first times doing this in this way. 
usually there's a lot of horses and a lot of my family standing around me. <laughs> so if you've ever seen the Dakota 38 ride, the big silver truck outside is the truck that leads the horses in, and I'm the guy with the wolf on his head that's usually standing with a bunch of stuff talking. Waka tonka takuni tawa tonka yaka ota ma piaki e anakecha ma kaki e duo cha spe spa cha spe wa na wa ke chi he na o ya ki hi translated into english it means many and great o oh god are your works Maker of earth and sky. Your hands have set the heavens with stars. Your fingers spread the mountains and plains. Lo, at your word, the waters were formed. Deep seas obey your voice. While they were singing the song, they were hung. He actually said, it's, this is a great day. This is not a day of defeat. This is a day when we go to meet the one who created us. We return to our point of origin and we return to be with him. Well, to be with God. When I heard that, it broke me. Because I had never heard that side of the story before. Even growing up Indian, it was just something that, you know, what makes you Indian? I don't know. You like the Braves? Yeah. When they're winning. <laughs> You like the Chiefs now that they won the Super Bowl? Yeah. <laughs> and then I went on the ride. And I'm sitting around all of these people who look like me, talk like me, and hearing all of these amazing stories as everyone moves in unison that there's nobody left behind, that everybody has a purpose, no matter how great or small. I remember one of my sons walking up to me. He's like, yeah. I'm like, what's going on? He goes, Uncle Orville just, well, he calls him Grandpa Orville. But Grandpa Orville just talked to me while I was taking out the garbage. I was like, really? What did he say? He goes, he told me it was a great honor that I was picking up for my people and making sure that we were going in a good way because wherever we go, we want to leave the place better than when we found it. And so my job is so important here. I said, what are you going to do? I'm going to go find more garbage. <laughs> so I said, okay. You know, the level of honor, the level of love, the way that we communicate, where everybody's voice is heard, where our elders speak to our children and everywhere in between. And where when we're moving as one, we understand that we can't be stopped. That we can do things with prayer in a good way, and we can make things happen. Which is always interesting for me because um, we were actually part of the engineering of the first weapon of mass destruction. Because when we were busy fighting on the plains, the cavalry wrote, uh, they, have, they move in such a way that we can't fire enough bullets to knock them off their horses. And so a man named Richard Gatling goes, well, I do have an invention. The Gatling gun was actually developed specifically for the, the Plains War, for the Indian Wars. 
because of the way that we would do battle. My sons still love playing around with it and I enjoy watching them fall off their horses every now and then. Um, but you actually kind of hang your, you grab a hold of the mane and then you get your leg right up around the haunches or the tail and then you hang from underneath the neck and you fire a bow or a gun or whatever. And so a lot of times what they would see is just these pack of horses riding in and then all of a sudden the horses would start firing projectiles at them, which was very confusing to a lot of them. And then I started hearing all of the stories about us, about how we lived. And I thought it was interesting but I was still just a city Indian. But as I learned more and more and my kids got involved, I was just like, I should probably think this is important. And then one of my sons got suckered in the same way I got suckered in. And he hopped on the ride in Flandreau, because <laughs> we have a break day in Flandreau. And right before he got on his horse for the first time, he said, just so you know, Dad, I can only be here for three days. He said, I thought you took all that time off. He goes, I did. Um, but so you know, I've relapsed. And I know that everybody's supposed to be sober and in prayer. And he said, I, I think 72 hours is the longest I can make it. And I said, okay. Okay, you know, just, it'll just be good. Your grandma's happy. Your aunts are all happy. We're all just glad you're here. And he got on the horse, and it was crazy because the horse was named Gunner, and he bit and threw everybody. <laughs> like, he was just one of those horses. But he got on Andre, and they just moved fluidly. And we got to the end of the third day, and he was on Gunner and he just kind of, we finished up and he just kind of rode away and just sat on the top of the horse. And as he was sitting there, I said, something's wrong, I gotta go over and talk to him about it. I get over there and he's crying. I said, are you okay? He goes, no. I said, you're gonna get sick? He says, no. I said, what's going on? He looks at me, he goes, I get it, Dad. I said, what do you mean? He goes, I get what it means to be Indian. I said, so do I need to get you home? He goes, I'm not leaving. And if you happen to see uh, USA Today, a couple other papers that covered it that year, you'll see a young man with scruffy brown hair kind of combed off to the side, sitting tall on his horse, clear eyes, head held proud. That's my son, and he's been clean ever since then. The thing is for us that we, we had so much history here. We had huge areas. I actually, one of my uh, relatives was telling me some stories, and he goes, we, well, we actually did. Some of us lived in Faribault. And I said, really? What part? He says, Tipi Tonka, right in the center of the big village. And, and so in the past year, this has been a journey for me where I'm discovering all of these different things. And the hardest part is, is I go to my elders and so many of them are getting so much older that we've actually started recording a lot of their stories. Because quite honestly, for so long, none of us wanted to hear it. I mean, we're like, what does it matter? You know, what does it matter? And even when I had to start growing my hair out because I held a position. I said, Grandma, why do I gotta grow my hair out? She says, I said, I don't like it, it's hot. It's, I mean, have you ever had, you know, you know I, I said stupid questions because she's got really long hair. <laughs> <laughs> and she just kind of looked at me and I knew that if I said anything further, I'd just have to make sure I could run faster scared <laughs> than she could angry. And then she looked at me and she said, grow it out for all of the people who couldn't. 
grow it out for all of those who were forced to cut their hair. Because in your braid, it reminds you of a trinity, mind, body, and spirit. Because everything is in threes. For the creator is in threes. And so that's why I grow my hair. It's not for a fashion conscious thing. It's not for when I love it, because honestly, when we hit those 100, day, 100 degree days in summer, all I want to do is lay a razor to it. <laughs> but by us learning our history and sharing our history, we're at a point in time in American history where so much identity has been lost. And many people have this strange fascination with us. And quite honestly, it's because we, <coughs> the Industrial Revolution didn't need a beautiful tribal people. It needed cogs for a machine. And Europeans were just the first to suffer from it. You know, they're Germanic tribes, Celtic tribes, all of these, <coughs> you know, you get up into the north. I've met native people from all over the world who are, who are traditionally native from their home countries at places that I didn't expect to have. Like, we met these Germanic tribe people that were just the coolest and made, had great food. I like food, but um, we stand in a place where so much history occurred in such a way. And, and really, Abilities to build bridges. You know, as I'm talking all about this, I had a friend invite me to church because I'm a touring worship leader and a speaker. And it was just the Catholic church right down the street. And I'm walking in the door and I'm kind of looking at stuff and I see this area just filled with Indian artifacts. And the lady's like, I don't want to ask, but are you native? I said, yeah. And she goes, so what part of this interests you? I said, well, that, I think that's my grandpa. And she goes, oh. And then she said the magic words. She goes, this was once Bishop Whipple's. This is part of part Bishop Whipple's collection. Yeah. The really cool part about that is, is in this area, most people don't understand this part, and if any of you are interested, I can connect you to a friend of mine who will show you the letters, that we actually had an amazing relationship with the settlers here. We all traded freely. We all traded freely over in New Ulm. We all, in all of these areas. In fact, the most interesting thing that I have learned most recently is my friend Jeremy, who is a dear friend and makes a whole bunch of really cool stuff with leather and fur, showed me some letters from his great-great-grandparents. And one of the things that you will not see in the history books is, I guess, you know, kind of like today, nobody was a real fan of the government back in the 1860s. <laughs> and he showed me letters where his great-great-grandfather talks about the cavalry coming out to their farms and force-marching farmers from that area to witness the hanging. And one of the cavalry people actually told him, we want to show you what happens when you try and go against the government. We're at a point where we have a possibility that if we learn our proper history, we have an ability to go back to the whole dream of America. That's part of the reason that I love being American Indian. We're the only people where we put America first. <laughs> Everybody else is something American. But the thing is, is when you heard me say it at the beginning, how matakiapi, hello my relatives, that's actually meant for anybody who can hear it. Because we believe that we come from one point. In fact, one of the most interesting words that we recently translated properly is a word called tunkashala. And when I grew up, I was afraid to say that word simply because it meant grandfather and I was taught that was a demonic word because we were praying to our grandfather. 
And one of my cousins who doesn't believe the same as I do, but in our culture we have the ability to believe however we want without shaming the other. In fact, you can believe however you want, but if you bring shame on somebody for what, something for what they believe, that's actually disrespectful and dishonoring. He goes, I know you're going to love this, but I know I'm supposed to tell you this. He goes, we translated Tunkashala. And I said, okay. He goes, do you know what it means? I was like, well, I thought it meant grandfather. He goes, kind of. He goes, it actually means the father of all fathers, the originating point. Once again, the translators just decided to shorten it up or pronounce it however they wanted to change a face, to change a way. And I think it's so important to do that, to just find the roots of it. Because one of the things that we first learned as an empire, as, as who we were, is the first move in an empire is to divide and conquer. And, and we're standing in a time period where today's history is starting to look a lot like yesterday's history. But the reality is, is that we have 38 men who sacrificed their lives for people. They did it with honor. They did it with duty. And to send you down even a stranger rabbit trail and you can believe whatever you want to believe, that it was so actually unpopular in the United States that Abraham Lincoln decided to do something very serious to try and turn public opinion to him. So six days later, he issued something called the Emancipation Proclamation. And so if you ask my grandma, she'll actually say that that's what he did to try and turn public opinion. And, I, and when I asked her, what, what do you think my grandpa would say about it? He, he would, and she looked me in the eye and she said, I know what he'd say about it. He'd say, if that's a sacrifice it took, then it's worth it. We were ferocious people. We always have been. We fight for whatever we believe in. A lot of y'all got to see that uh, during Standing Rock. Um, some of you guys saw my sons and two of my nephews uh, riding their horses around the National Guard and slapping the back of the their six-wheelers as they did it, um, because in our culture uh, we have a thing called counting coup, and when you count coup you get feathers that kind of look like that. What counting coup is, is actually getting your enemy to a mortal strike place and then sparing their lives. In fact, on the battlefield if you counted coup, it was kind of like a bad game of tag, is how my grandpa would would say that there would be men who would actually leave the battlefield, sit by the side, and then our women would actually bring them what's called watech or watecha, which literally <laughs> translates to a to-go plate. <laughs> and they would bring them a plate and they would pray on them, that, pray over them that they would have a safe journey home. For us, that's how we waged war. That was what we, because we didn't like to take men's lives. But we were also a nation that understood that if war came to us, we would have to respond in whichever way it was brought to us. And unfortunately, um, some French trappers and the American government worked together so that in Austin, Minnesota, they started out by paying a $50 bounty for a redskin. And the redskin was the flap of skin that they took off of a man, woman, or child. A scalp. The bounty even got up to $300. Now, $50 doesn't seem much today, especially if you try and fill up your car. But in the 1860s, $50 was about the equivalent of 10 grand. By the time it got to $300, just do the math. In fact, most uh, archaeological historians will say that that's why blonde-haired people settled here. Because Germans settled here and they're like, hey, they got dark hair. <laughs> and the, you know, all of the northern Germanic tribes that came here all of a sudden had Indian issues where they all lost the top of their heads. But blondies, well, you can't turn that in for 300 bucks. 
but it's really hard to say the American government hired mercenaries that went awry. In this day and age, I think some of us can find that not a short stretch. Um, but if you have any questions about that, just Google Austin, Minnesota, Redskin, $50, and you will actually see the ad that went out in the paper where the, Ameri where the United States government offers $50 for every Redskin. Part of the reason we had the issue with the Redskins football team. Because quite honestly, if you're a Jewish descent, would you want to see a football team called the Lampshades? That was our perspective from it. I know there are many different opinions and many different options on it, and quite honestly, for me, I don't care. I do care if it creates disrespect. I do care if it creates hatred. I do care if it hurts people. But quite honestly, I love the fact that the Chiefs won the Super Bowl. I thought that was really cool. And if you go to the res, you will see a lot of Kansas City Chiefs world champions hats flying around there. It's a name. Yeah. As long as it's done, you know, and fortunately we've evolved where they aren't burning effigies anymore, so that makes it a little easier. You know, but we're at this amazing turning point, and that's part of the reason that I love history and part of the reason that I think it's important for us all to understand it and study it is just simply because I believe that the reason history repeats itself is we get chances to change it, to do it right the second time. And just from an Indian's perspective, I have watched my kids, who let's face it, growing up in today's society, have really turned out to be decent human beings because they were given an identity. They were able to understand who they are, what they were created to do, that they can live and walk in a good way. And the thing is, is that's what all of my relatives hoped for. That's what we wanted. It was all part of the, the American dream. You know, if you look at Article, article 6, Section 2 of the Constitution, it actually says that treaty rights shall be the supreme law of the land. And it was stated that when they wrote that, it actually, someone actually stood up and said, and if that law is not followed, then no law in the land shall be followed. And the most interesting part of that is it's actually the preamble to the laws. They actually wrote that the first time. That was the first, what they considered the most important part of it, was honoring the things that they did. And so when you guys see us doing the various things that you do, see, it's really in many ways what most of us are trying to do is just uh, is to exercise our treaty rights. I noticed that there was a little uh, movement when they talked about, uh, when I mentioned Standing Rock, but understand this, that the first area that they bulldozed was a place where he had buried chiefs and great warriors. So just to put it from your perspective, you all know what sits just south of the airport. All of those amazing white gravestones of men who sacrificed their men and women who sacrificed their lives for very amazing things. How would you feel if somebody took a D5 dozer and just started knocking those things down? And then told you that they were gonna place something closer to your community in the same area, same setup, that was decided in Bismarck that it would poison the people. And so that's why it came over here. I don't want to get into politics. I don't want, that's just our view on it. But I will also tell you that every single issue that we have had as a people, we have come unarmed. Because we believe like the 38 belief that we can pray together and change things. And the best part of that is, is that through the Dakota 38 ride, we have gone from people leveling guns at us and telling us to just keep going to all of these different places welcoming us and wanting to hear the stories. We have gone from 
having to basically sleep in trucks, cars, vans, wherever we could to communities, opening community centers for us. And we've been able to tell our tale. We don't talk about our relatives by name for anyone who's deceased just out of honor for them. But if you go down to where they have all the names listed, I will tell you that two of my sons, one is named Dewan Samani, which he walks, he sings while he walks. And my other son, one of my other sons is named Dewan Sa Mato, singing bear. If we continue to understand who we are, and we continue to move in an area where we can understand history to a flat level, because it gets ugly on both sides. Mm -hmm. it, it, there, are, there are good and bad all the way through that. We can be forced not to relive it. But the other thing is, is that we can have a chance at moving to something different. What do I mean by that is in 2019, we came into town and I was speaking and one of my dear friends who was at that time was sitting as I believe speaker of the house, his name is Jack Considine and I always mispronounce his last name but I looked at him and I said, Jack, and I, hand, I got ready to hand the mic, he goes, stall, the governor is here. And the governor of Minnesota showed up. And the governor and the lieutenant governor basically apologized to us for what the state of Minnesota had done. And the governor swore that it would never happen again. And I got a really awkward, really tear-filled hug from him. Um, because let's just face it, when you meet somebody and they just kind of fall in, you meet somebody, they're the governor, and then they kind of fall into your arms and they cry. It's just weird, especially when there's like 4,000 people around you. And as he was doing that, he whispered into my ear, he said, is there anything more we can do? And at that time, my Uncle Arvel um, happened to be there, and he is a very well-respected chief. And I said, I, I don't know. I can't answer for that because my position doesn't allow that. And I went over, and I said, Uncle Arvel, is there, he just asked me, he said, is there anything more he can do? And he looked at me, and he goes, the truth's been told. It's done. I think that's the thing, is there's so much of history where the views have been one-sided. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, you know, this is, this was 2019, it was 157 years after the fact. It took 157 years for somebody in the same position as my uncle to not only state the truth, but to apologize. But the thing is, is the way that we are as a people, the truth's been told, it's done. And the most interesting thing is, is for our ride, it actually changed it because we, the whole ride started to bring attention for the Dakota 38. And the next thing you know, it's an immersion ride so that we can teach everyone what our culture was about. Why? Because it's done. The truth's been told. And so, I think that's all we're all after. We're all sick of the lies. We're all sick of shenanigans. We're all sick of all of the different things in such a way, and we need to press in and learn about all of these different histories so we can actually come together once again. And I know that I may have not been fully <sighs> Statistic, 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 but we're an oral tradition people, and this is kind of, like I said, new for me. We don't need statistics. And I just wanted to come in and, and share my heart from my perspective and, and tell you the stories that I know. But the reality is, we're still here. 
we don't want to be warlike nations. We just want to live in Matakuye Ayasin. We're all related. You know, it's just like me and my beautiful friend right here. She said, we met at Great Clips. <laughs> and she said, are, are you native? I said, yeah. <laughs> me too. <laughs> but an instant bond was created from that because it just erased everything. You know, and it doesn't have to be just because we're native. My son is, is half Irish. And honestly, when he came on the ride, he started getting kind of weird because he's like, I just don't like white people. I'm like, Bob's, you're half white. <laughs> he's like, but what do they do to our people? I said, I get it. And one day he's like going off. I said, Andre, do you realize that you came from two sets of beautiful tribal people? I said, you came from us and you came from the Celts. And the Celts were an amazing people with an amazing culture who had their own language and their own abilities. They created all of these amazing, wonderful things. Then they had some issues with St. Patrick and it got a little sideways, but... <laughs> <laughs> but you come from two sets of beautiful tribal people. And one of my other kids who's adopt, who is adopted was like, what about me? I said, you got like... You're a key. You are a combination of a whole bunch of different tribal people and that gives you the ability to affect all of those people in one way or another because you're their descendant. Everything they went through, everything they did, all comes down to you. And in our world and in our culture, we actually believe that everything we say, everything we do echoes for seven generations. And it's part of the way that a lot of reason that a lot of us live that way. Because honestly, in the back of my head, I've got a woman who's about this tall, who's just under 100 years old that I'm scared to death of. <laughs> who says, Takoja, grandson. Remember, seven generations. And it helps change how I am towards people. Why? Because it's not about me. It's about my children, it's about my children's children, it's about my children's children's children. And if I can tell the stories in a good way and we can find these middle points, we can actually stare into a much better future than we're looking at right now. And we can have abilities to tell all the tales of all of the things that happened to get all of us to these points in life in such a way that maybe we can find peace in it all. Because quite honestly, I never thought that I would be standing in Mankato surrounded by all of these different people who just want to know what happened. And then once they know what happened, they're like, can I come back next year? Sure. Would you mind if I came on the ride? Not at all. Will you put me on a nice horse? Uh, we'll, we'll try. <laughs> um, but there's also the thing of like, if horse open you get that horse and if there's one horse open there's a reason they're open <laughs> <laughs> you know, so if we share our stories we share our history we share our lives maybe we can see something different than what the people who went before us did you know, I don't want to lambaste anybody I don't want to talk about anything that would be intentionally hurtful but I do want people to know what it took for me my children and my children's children to survive to this point so that when you see us you understand that there's a reason that we grow our hair long there's a reason that we have feathers there's a reason that all this because we never want to forget that our what our ancestors went through to get us to the point we were told that we would never return to Minnesota. In fact, on the federal books, there's still a law saying me being here, I'm considered off reservation, so I am considered hostile and I should be killed on sight. That's still on the books, it's still a federal law. And with the three of us sitting in the room, we're considered a war party, so the cavalry should be called. <laughs> <laughs> and really, we're just learning stuff at the historical center. And, and so that's, that's kind of one of those things of part of why we educate, 
because my sons grew up knowing that there's a federal law that they could be killed at any moment. And in the 1980s, a guy actually fought it in the Supreme Court and got off because he killed an Indian in a bar fight and the Indian was not on the reservation. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't see any cavalry. Let's smack some And I haven't seen anything that would indicate that any of you are here to try and defend that law. But I also know that by me stating that, you might remember it. And start to see through some of the perspective of how we were forced to view the world. But also understand that I am standing here in Minnesota Makoche. They're sitting here. My sons in Winona riding motorcycles around. My daughters are just having a great time and raising their families. We don't have to let laws or the government define us. But if we let our relatives define us in a good way, we can change things. We can move things and we can do what America was originally founded to do. If you look at documents, it is the only document, it is the first historical document that says, we, the people. And if you ask the Mohawk, who are part of the Iroquois Confederacy, which the document was pulled from, you'll ask them, what's that little squiggle mark up at the top that's not Mohawk? And they'll say, no. What's Dakota? It actually means Haumatakipi. Our influence, our structure, our wants are littered through all of the history of the United States and it's not a want for supremacy, it's not a want for anything else but existence and family. My grandfather was killed and I'm actually told that I sound just like him because my great-grandmother said, I was told my dad saying his voice sounded just like him and, and when he spoke it sounded just like him and you sound like my dad. And she's the one who would say, I know what he'd say. If that's what it took, then the sacrifice was worth it. So my big brother would say, I'm going to go about that far. I just want to thank you guys for listening. I want to thank you guys for allowing me to share. And just bless every one of you for coming out and bless your families and bless everything around you in such a way where we can remember that we're all related. And what we do echoes for seven generations. So if we're a little better to each other, our next generation has the same chance, even better. And someday beyond us, we could all just realize that everything we did in life was worth it because our family's better. Well, first of all, I want to say um, I really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Exceeded my expectations. Um, but my question is, uh, being a product of the 1960s, uh, I grew up listening to people like Russell Means and the AIM movement. Um, is that still in effect today? Uh, what are your thoughts about that? Um, it's very hard for me because my family is very heavily involved with AIM, but I think that, um, I think AIM had a purpose. What most people don't realize is that at Wounded Knee, uh, part of that purpose was that um, uranium had been discovered in Pine Ridge. And they started to do some testing and they started to do some strip mining. And so all of a sudden people started getting sick with these strange tumors and these strange growths and started realizing some shenanigans were going on. Some people discovered that they were trying to strip mine the uranium and they were murdered. At that point, the FBI came in and uh, they started to try and settle things. And part of their settling things was arming a group called the Guardians of the Oglala Nation or the Goon Squad with AR-15s and M-16s. 
and all of a sudden all of the traditional people uh, started getting gunned down by 223 rounds. On Pine Ridge in 1972, there were almost 1,000 unsolved murders on a reservation of 10,000. Um, Russell Means was in Minneapolis, and people were in dire strait of need of help. And the American Indian Movement served a purpose. Um, what was the other main guy with AIM? Dennis Banks. There's one more. Uh, Dennis Banks, Russell Means. Pardon? Clyde. Yeah. Clyde. Yeah, Clyde, Clyde Belcourt and Robodeau who's actually one of my uncles, who actually one of the Robodeau family. One of my other relatives is a guy named Leonard Peltier. Um, he was accused of shooting an FBI agent. Uh, one of the Robodeaux actually showed up in court and said, I have the rifle, I'm the one who shot him, do ballistic testing, let him go. And this is about 20 years ago now. And they went, nope, we got our man. And so um, that's the... I think the American Indian Movement had its thing at the time, but I also am in well aware that Leonard Peltier is somebody who has been proven time and time and time and time and time again that he is completely innocent, and right now he's in Clearwater, Florida Correctional Institute dying of cancer, mm -hmm. and he just wants to come home to die. And so when you see me with my American Indian Movement stuff, I think the new American... This is going on TV. I think the new American Indian Movement is very well intended, uh, like many of the groups that are well intended at this time, but I don't know if they have a really good grasp of what it was really about when it was founded. Um, so when you see me with American Indian Movement stuff, it's actually uh, more for the understanding and for people to pay attention to my uncle who just wants to go home to die. So I think that Amos cool. I think they've done a lot of really good stuff. Um, I think just like any other political or social group, there's been a lot of active, uh, you know, divide and conquer. Uh, it's the methodology of any empire. And so it creates chaos and it creates perversion and it creates things that just are weird. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. They're getting better, but it's very, very weird. Um, because it's, as an example, the, the Ramsey House. Everybody, many people who are aware of history know the Ramsey House. Most people aren't aware that it was one of our sacred sites. It was also a very large village, and he slaughtered absolutely everybody, man, women, and child, so he could build that house there. So it, it's one of those things where it's very hard. They're doing their best and it's really changed. Like if you go to the Ramsey house, they're starting to discuss those things. But the hard part is that the Wild West was brutal. And so it developed people with brutal mindsets. And you have people who are fed, and I know this is a new term to y'all, but fake news. Where they're believing, like I said, it's easier to kill a, a godless savage than a faith-filled family man. And so we were dehumanized to a point where it was just, I mean, the reason you won't see any Indians celebrating the death of, or not celebrating, but um, really being expressive on the death of Queen Elizabeth is we all know that she bought 10 Indian children, brought them back to England, and they just kind of disappeared along the way. You know, and, and so... So when, as, it, as we uncover the history, because of the dehumanizing, it's very difficult to stare into it. And honestly, I think it needs to have baby steps because you rip those Band-Aids off and there's still a big gaping wound. So, but compared to walking into the Ramsey house as an Indian and seeing all of the amazing aspects of Governor Ramsey in Minnesota, to now they're actually starting to enter in exhibits where they're starting to do those things um, and just show it. I think it's cool. But I also think that a lot of this history, it's like, it's so raw, it's so real, it's so bloody and it's so terrible in so many different ways that that's the only way you can really enter into it without people getting hurt or offended. And it's not that I don't want to offend or hurt people, but if you're backpedaling, you're not gonna listen. 
you're going, you're going to shut down. And so we have to unpack it piece by piece, one by one, because it's an assault on the senses. I mean, it's really, as an Indian, realizing that, you know, just 40 minutes away was the largest mass execution in American history. And then realizing that I'm actually related to four of them, and one of them's in my direct bloodline. And I was, I didn't understand I was in the direct bloodline until 2018. I thought everybody was just super, I knew I was loosely related, but I wasn't aware that I was right in there. And I will tell you that when I found that out, even with my family around me, even with everybody around me, it wrecked me for like three days because of all the heaviness, all of the weight, and all the this. And I don't want anybody else to have to go through those things, no matter what side you're on. What wrecks me is knowing that I'm a part of this white mess. Yeah. And I don't have any pride in white people. Yeah, but I, honestly, I think that's part of the divide and conquer. It's more rich and poor, industrial and non-industrial. Yeah. My point is the fact that as whites, we had problems too. We had our Cassidy's that were mm -hmm. family members of the white family too. But when we tell history, we should say, okay, this happened to the whites, but this happened to the Indians right beside yeah. it. And, you know, like instead of taking my history away that I know, add to it. Mm -hmm. Instead of taking down a statue of Abraham Lincoln, add somebody, an Indian or something right next to it with that sure. story attached. And I get that, but I think sometimes to uncover history, you have to start at the roots. We have to go back to the beginning. And, and, and I appreciate everybody who's come here. I have friends whose families who have been here for 10 or 15 generations, but I've been here, my family's been here for 48 generations. And so when we're actually talking about a diaspora of history for one significant area, my family was in Fairbo at approximately 600 AD. So there's 1,000, 1,200 years of history easily before anybody else had history here. And, and if you're gardening, do you just cut off the top or do you have to go down to the bottom of the root and start at the beginning? You know, and, and that's, that's kind of where I sit in it is because we all live in a rural area. If you pluck out the top of a dandelion, what happens? But if you dig all the way down to the root where it started and then come back. But those stories need to be I think it's very important. But I also think that we have to start at the beginning. You can't complete a story if you only read half the book. If you open a book halfway through and read the end, it's not going to make sense because none of the context of the beginning is there. So are the, are the Native, uh, Native Americans or indigenous, I, I never know what Call it what you want. Like I actually say. prefer First Nations or Indian, but and I know that some of you guys say Indian in here, you're going to get a real weird look. Yeah. But <laughs> um, the thing with, that I want is to learn the other side. Yeah. And to put those two sides together yeah. and under, try to understand yeah. both sides. And it it's sometimes is very difficult because when you try to make a comment, sometimes somebody comes back with a real punch in the gut. Well, and, and for us, it's simply because we have over a thousand years of history before that. You know, and if you look in a history book, you won't find those thousand years. Are the Indi are they trying to write stories so that people can understand those stories? Um, we've been writing them for a long time. If you go down to Jeffers Petroglyphs, you'll see our stories that have existed there since. Uh, that's how they know, 600 A.D. That we can understand. Uh, the Iroquois. Um, we're doing a lot of translating. We're recording a lot of the traditions. But like I said, we were much more import We placed much more importance on people being in the same room, being able to exchange, and seeing all. Well, storytelling, yes. But you can see if you were reading what I just expressed, would you feel any of the emotion that you felt while you were in the room? Some of it, but not all of it. Right. Yeah. 
one comment about oral tradition. You mentioned Solomon's Temple. Yep. And a few hundred years after that was the exile of the leading citizens of Jerusalem yeah. to Babylon for a few decades. And that was a turning point because prior to that exile, the Hebrew people thought an oral tradition would be more accurate yes. than written tradition. Yep. But with the breakdown of their society, that's when they flipped over right. saying, let's have a written tradition. So I would not want anyone to denigrate yeah. an oral tradition passed down for yeah. centuries. Yep. But my question is really, who gets the credit or where did it start in the phrase, forgive everyone, everything? My Uncle Jim. Jim Miller. And then um, if you are interested in reading a historical book on it about oral tradition in Minnesota, uh, my aunt Gwen Westerman, who teaches Dakota history at Minnesota State University, uh, she actually wrote a book called Minnesota Makoche. And if you have any, where it talks about all the oral, oral tradition and actually how, how accurate it was like how historians were actually, when they started describing landmarks that they had never seen. And they were like, this has gotta be the spot. All of this stuff is here. And so, and then you've got, uh, and my uncle Glenn teaches language there. So he teaches, yeah. Oh, right on. <laughs> over there and then over there, yeah. Yeah. December 10th to December 26th. We actually arrive in Mankato at the day and time of the hanging. So we leave in Lower Brule, South Dakota, which was the first reservation we were taken to. And then we come east and we ride until we hit Mankato on December 26th. So. And where is that in Mankato? Reconciliation Park. Oh. Uh, fun fact of Reconciliation Park, it is not the hanging site. Um, the hanging site is actually underneath the bridge, and it was really hard for them to go, we'll uproot the bridge just to come out. <laughs> so. My wife's not here, but if she were, she would say, what can you say about the involvement of women now and historically? Uh, you've talked a lot about your sons and your grandmothers, mm -hmm. and you've read from <coughs> grandmothers and, and your, the lady who wrote does now, but to what extent do women ride? Oh yeah, oh yeah, my nieces and all that. Um, we're actually kind of a, we're actually kind of matriarchal. Yeah. Um, we actually kind of protect that though in our language. We actually have two languages. We have a men's language and we have a women's language. The women are allowed to speak both languages. We're not allowed to speak the women's language because it's the nurturer's language. So, um, in, so it's it's really it's a very equated society. Like for me, I would say how. That's how prevalent our culture was. That's hello. And so when you see the old movies of how, some Italian guy being like, how white man? That was actually our language. But a woman, I can speak it in a way for teaching. A woman would say, huh. So they actually have a whole separate language and they can speak both. Uh, back there and then. Sure. And I fully understand that you went down to get hung, covered up, not shaking anybody's hand as the hanger did it. As if anybody hung anybody up there. And you're saying somebody did? You can actually read the letters that the, uh, that the cavalrymen wrote. If you read the letters from prison, you'll actually see where the cavalry members talk about this was crazy. They started singing, they started, they shook people's hands. It isn't in your history books, but a lot of what we've had to do is go back because letter writing was a big thing. People are sending email back and forth and some people, I think it was, I can't remember who it was, but they started collecting all of these letters from the area and historical events and that's how they figured that one out. So I think it's called Letters from Prison and it's Letters for the Dakota 38 and it's a lot of the people who held them captive and the people around there. And then also uh, Jeremy's relatives talk about it in their letters, the ones that were actually forced marched from New Ulm. I just want to chime in that we actually sell both that book as well as Gwen Westerman's book. Okay. So if you're interested, we have it. Um, what about this? A couple of years ago they wanted to exonerate. Exoneration. What do you mean? They didn't do anything. 
Right. Can I get an apology and maybe some money? I don't know about the next part. Exoneration. Uh, that was all solved when the governor admitted it and apologized. Yep. Yeah, we're not. That's why we have a billion dollars sitting in the bank account for all of the land for the we, from that's west of the Missouri, because we don't want the money. We want a formal. We want the truth and an apology. In 1980, the Supreme Court ruled that most of the land west of the Missouri River was taken illegally and should be returned. And you can actually look that up. I believe it's 1984. And it was 105 million at the time, and they just started, they kept raising it up, raising it up, raising it up. And the general discussion was, we don't want the money. We want you to tell the truth. You tell the truth, and then we can start discussing from there. So, uh, and then. What time do you arrive in the 10 a.m. Time of the hanging. Oh yeah, you hit Facebook and just hit Dakota 38 and okay. there's a lot of the people from the, the towns and stuff are, oh yeah. Oh yeah, we will, it's, it, everybody's welcome to attend and. Is there anything be, you bring for the writers? Anything you want. I mean, if you got good chocolate chip cookies, we always like that. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it, a lot of people bring a lot of different things. You have to realize that a lot of these guys um, you'll see us raising money for it because to do the ride, it actually costs us about seventy to eighty thousand um, dollars. Most of us just provide our own gas, provide our own horses, provide all that. But there's a lot of people where, like, some of the kids that come along with us, will actually say, "This is the best I eat all year," and so we raise money um, so they can just come with us. Because we've actually one time we actually had a horse trailer pull up. And six kids jumped out. There weren't any horses in the trailer. There were kids. Because they had all gotten their dad's truck. And they did. it was a two-seater truck. And they all wanted to come on the ride. So the other kids piled in with blankets. Because this is December in South Dakota. Into the back of the horse trailer and came to the ride. So. Okay. Our book club read a book called Daybreak Woman. Okay. She was part Dakota. Okay. Married to a Scotsman. And it tells her story through her children. She didn't write many letters, but her children did. And it tells the stories where they were moved from one place to another, ended up in the Fort Stelling. Yeah. They actually came to Faribault and take the trail by Alexander Faribault. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned a lot of names that came up in that book. Probably. And it tells how they lost their land to the white people that moved in and for pennies on a dollar. Yeah, that. if that. Um, part of the reason that I have these, these little black beads are actually some of the original beads of the beads and trinkets. Uh, these were the original Lewis and Clark beads before they became the bumblebees. And so when we talk about beads and trinkets, this is actually the original money. And that's why I actually wear it on this, at this part, because it reminds me that money means nothing. It's just a glass bead. I came to this meeting because I read this book and I wanted to see if I recognized anything. Oh, well, I'm glad you recognized some of it. So. <laughs> yeah. but, I mean, it was very informative. Thank I also you. I have this story. My grandmother lived on a farm in Lafayette, Minnesota. They had a log cabin and she would feed, give loaves of bread to the Indians that came up. Mm -hmm. No, there's actually, um, if you know Wagner, um, Wagner Orchards, okay. um, they're over by Mankato. They're owned by a guy named David Wagner. Um, he actually has a story about when the war started. Um, a bunch of guys came to his grandfather and like, you got to get your family out of here. It's going to get really bad really fast. You got to get your family out of here. And all of a sudden a war party came out of the woods and they're like, get down, get down, get down. And they were like, they went that way and sent the war party off. And then he's like, get your family, get whatever you can take. We'll take you out of here. And they took him to a safe spot. I actually, I think Sam had a question. Yes, he did. I was in choir with him. Right on. Yeah, yeah he has a very deep voice like me. And <laughs> yep. Um, great. No idea. That's, uh, that's really a thing which is super incidental. Yep. Awesome. Nope. That would be my boy. Okay. <laughs> you mentioned learning about um, you know, your Faribault connection relatively recently. What has been most helpful or informative in that process? 
this place is one of them, of just being able to come and see the, all of the different things preserved. Uh, the fact that the Alexander Faribault House still stands, I think that's really cool. You know, and just being able to piece together a lot of the stories that I've heard with a lot of the landscapings and things like that. Um, because where I live in Medford, I actually, and a lot of my relatives believe that that's actually where we lived. I live up on the hill behind the school. And I'm sitting out there and after some very weird experiences that we can talk about some other time, I had the Dakota honoring thing and then I was just standing there and my aunt happened to call and I said, she's like, what are you doing? I said, I'm trying to figure something out. And she goes, what? And I said, I'm at the highest point of the county. There's fields, the river's right down there. Like I'm in a spot that would be, and she goes, perfect for a village. I said, yeah. She goes, yeah, you're probably standing where we used to be. So. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, I think I think rich versus poor has been a long change, bat long battle, uh, much longer. And as the easiest way is like the way one of my uncles says it. He goes, you know, um, a politician walks into the room. There's an Indian, a banker, and a white man sitting at the table. Politician takes out 10 cookies, gives the banker five of them, and then gives the banker three of them. And then gives the Indian one and goes, hey man, the white man took all your cookies. <laughs> I, I think that there's, it's, it's, it's been, ever since the discovery of the new world, it's been profiteers versus victims. And, and the first rule of an empire is divide and conquer. You know, and then most of what we're dealing with now is the complex that's left over from that. It's the aftermath. It's people who had nothing to do with it, but they're all, we're all suffering the repercussions from it from in one way or another. You know, it's, it's like um, they, tried to use, uh, they tried to use the Cherokee as slaves. They wouldn't even come close to us at the time. Cherokee kept on running away. So then they tried the Irish. The Irish kept on running away because there were other Irish people up north. So then they found a people that were easily identifiable. Um, the hard part is, is that there were a lot of bonds created in there, um, but there were a lot of wrongs. And so there's repercussions from those wrongs, even if people don't know or understand it. And I think it's a lot of it, what we're dealing with nowadays is literally the old world profiteers versus the peasants. And they've just changed it. As year as year and year and year, it's been a progression. You know, and that's, that's really what I believe we're, we're dealing with. We're dealing with, you know, corporate entities who have no value on human life. And if they can keep us all just disagreeing and arguing, well, perfect, because they won't see what we're up to. You know, it was kind of like as things started happening in the government, you know, years ago. Remember my grandpa used to always say when he'd hear people cranking about it, he goes, yeah, y'all figured out what we figured out in 1492. <laughs> <laughs> so. Wasn't Bishop Whipple part of mitigating the sentences? Bishop about? Whipple is a hero yeah. in our book. He is a hero. He mitigated the sentences. Um, he actually, one of my one of the reasons I love this place is I didn't realize y'all had a Whipple church in the back until one day I stopped by and the Daughters of the American Revolution were here and I got to walk in and share some of this story and all that. It was just a crazy day and it was like really kind of one of those markers in my life. Now there's Bishop Whipple. There's also a man that we knew as Jacob Farmer um, who was uh, Matsky, Lauren Matsky. He was a farmer from Fairmont and he actually the thing is, he actually had found out that one of his descendants was one of the ox cart drivers. 
because one of the paths that we take back to Mankato is the path the ox carts went out on. And understand that um, when they got to the reservation, about at least 50% of the boats and passengers in the boats and the ox carts were not no longer available. Um, because the hanging took place in December, and for anybody who is brought into the internment camps in Fort Snelling, uh, down in Reconciliation Park, all of that, all of their Indian wear was taken, but not replaced. And so you had a bunch of naked people being sailed on boats on the Minnesota and the Missouri River and sitting on the back of ox carts in January, February, and March as they rode on an ox cart out to South Dakota. Um, Jacob Farmer, Lauren Matsky is a descendant of a man named Jacob Farmer who is one of the ox cart drivers. He came to my aunt years and years and years ago and he says, I feel like I'm supposed to join you. And she's like, sure, come on. Everybody's welcome. We're all related. And he actually walked back from Crow Creek, Lower Brule area, to Mankato. And everybody was like, get on your horse. He's like, you guys had to walk. I'm walking. No, just get in a truck. You guys had to walk. I'm walking. Just just do something. And so there's there's plenty of people who are, there are plenty of, white people, I, and I just say it that way because if you want to study the hideous history on all that, Virginia is actually the area where it all started, where they started actually nicknaming things. If you go to Europe, uh, the, our brand of racism is not seen in Europe because it wasn't created over there. It was Virginia during the slave trades when they started naming people colors. Um, and so we have actually many heroes. If you look on the um, if you look on the list, you'll actually see Lele Washichu, which means little white man, because he was a white guy that had been orphaned on the plains, and he was one of us, and he actually went instead of his father, because his father was old and sick. And in the, in, I think it's the court documents for that one. They sentenced his father to death. He said, my father's old and frail. He's going to die anyways. I'm young and strong. Take me instead. And so, it, like I said, for us, it wasn't about white and black. It wasn't even, like for my kids, I'm not allowed to call them my stepkids, even though I have a stepkid who is, or an adopted son who's Dominican and is blackity black black. And I'll use that in front of him, and so it's just an example. But he's my son. There's no differentiation. If you ask my sons, he's like, that's my brother. Well, he doesn't look like you. He's my brother but he is my brother. We didn't, we didn't see that, we just saw Tioshba, we saw family, we saw Tiwahe. Are you with us? Are you moving in a good way? Are you willing to be part of our community? Are you willing to just, you know, be help? Yeah. Okay, you're one of us. What do you mean? You're family, come on. You know, there, there's plenty of heroes that did that. I mean, there's the Wagner farm. They were always very good to people. It was actually even rumored that they helped on the Indian side during the war after the incident where they saved his whole family. And there was a lot of families around here too that were the whites and the Indians mm -hmm. had along like brothers and sisters. All well, it was said that's why, the, that's why the cavalry marched some people to town because everybody got along. Like I said, you can, his name's Jeremy McIntosh. He lives over in Owatonna. He can show you the letters of his grandparents where they said they marched us at town in gunpoint. And one of the men looked at me and said, this is what happens when you stand against the American government. And it wasn't, honestly, it was that you're, during, you're sitting there in the middle of civil war. The United States is divided. People are just angry with each other. You have all kinds of things going on. And it wasn't just one thing, it was a control issue. And they found the easiest way that they thought would control the issue at the time. You know, not that we, for any of you who don't know, we actually, we were being starved to death. And there are many stories, I will say that the history book one Sounds good, um, but I have a lot of elders who have, have told the story a different way. Um, 
and that's just, you know, that's something for another time. Yeah. I want to see it from all sides. If I only see it from one side, I, I get, uh, it's, it's basically like, like putting blinders on your horse. You know, it's actually um, one of the cool things that I forgot to mention until you said that is if you actually go out there, there's a picture of uh, Abraham Lincoln, my great, great, great grandfather and Bishop Whipple on a book in your exhibit. It's the same picture that's in the church over there. So. Yeah, no, I want to learn, I want to learn every history. This is American history. This is a place that was created for the great melting pot. I don't want to come and share one-sided view. Because if I share a one-sided view, then I'm just as blind as the next person. Whereas if I study all of these things, I have a chance at actually seeing how it really happened, sharing how it really happened, having actual real discussions on what it is. Because history is all of it. It's not just a little segment. Thank you. Yeah. All right, if you'll all... Uh, one more question. One more question. Sure. Sorry. I, I, back in the 70s, I saw a movie called Little Big Man. Sure. And I took an interest in Native culture back then because I think there was some realistic representations. Oh, yeah, there. pretty good flick. And uh, you feel that way, too? Yeah. Oh, and also, if you ever want to see a, hit, a movie on what happened in Pine Ridge, um, you can look for the movie Thunderheart. Um, it was actually made by Val Kilmer, and then um, John Trudeau was actually the main uh, anti-hero in it. What most people don't know is John Trudeau was actually one of the people in the fight. And when they made the movie, he actually came to Val Kilmer and said, I'd love you to make a documentary, and Val Kilmer said, if I make a documentary, no one will watch it. Let's make it a feature film. So if you watch Thunderheart, it's actually, it, it's pretty close to what was going on. And it tells the story in a really good way, but the only reason it's not a documentary is because Val Kilmer was so impassioned by the story that he felt if he made a documentary, nobody would watch it. All right.